I'd like to introduce you to Mike. Mike is a middle-class American and overall nice guy. He shows basic consideration to others, is generally kind and helpful, and broadly speaking holds to what we would consider decent values of equality and cooperation. He doesn't really ponder why he's like this, meaning he has little clue about the long history of societal development and moral philosophy that made these values second nature to him, or of the comfortable living conditions that make friendliness an effortless gesture with an immediate social payoff. Nor does he stop and think about whether, if our economy collapsed tomorrow, it would be more than a month before he'd gut his neighbor with a kitchen knife over a can of beans. He enjoys a life that most people around the world and across history would kill for, and he enjoys the fact that he's never had to kill or struggle against anybody for anything, and can thus add an easily won feeling that he's nicer than average to the list of psychological comforts that accompany his physical comforts. Of course, he has his minor prejudices, but who doesn't? And deep down, he really wants to maintain his lifestyle, but who doesn't? So along with not considering why he's nice, or under what conditions he might become less nice, he takes great care not to think about why he's comfortable and under what conditions he landed in and maintains his comfort. Somewhere at the edge of his mind, he's aware that other countries, and parts of the town he commutes to for work, are filled with swarms of people who are poorer than him in ways he doesn't even understand, and he might occasionally experience a flicker of realization that he could easily improve the lives of a handful of these people with only a minor change in his lifestyle or that this lifestyle might be built on economic arrangements that exploit some of them. But he doesn't park on these thoughts for long, and if he needs to, he can sweep them away with quick, deceptively easy answers about why the homeless are where they are, how hard he works for what he has, how little his meager contributions could do to change the problem on a global scale, or how economics are complex and people in sweatshops, if they're only paid pennies, are being paid pennies more than if the sweatshops weren't there. So while he'd stop and load groceries for an old woman or maybe spend an afternoon helping his neighbor with a project and perform either gesture with a smile on his face and the feeling that he's a good person warming his heart, he'd never move into a smaller house and start eating mac and cheese or even as much as dial down his ritual of circulating and then destroying a gratuitous volume of useless consumer goods every Christmas to help alleviate the horrors of somebody else's daily life. Maybe he can be forgiven for this because like I've already asked, how many people, regardless of their current lifestyle, wouldn't want to maintain that lifestyle, and who, swept up in a series of daily social, legal, and professional obligations that come at them so fast they don't have time to think about much less reconsider and start breaking them, would do so in a way that might upend the lives of their family and children in ways they can't fully predict the consequences of. So the point is not that Mike is horrible. It's that he's a nice guy, but he's a nice guy in a bubble that's easy to be nice in, and he's motivated to maintain this bubble, to, in ways he's probably not conscious of, Pretend that his lifestyle within the bubble is legitimate, and that in fact the bubble doesn't exist. This is generally done by avoiding thought about the broader historical and social context surrounding his immediate life, which isn't hard because all he has to do is not think too much, and not actively explore worlds outside his own. But one thing that's harder to ignore is the Bible. You see, Mike is a Christian who believes that the Bible is the inerrant word of an all-knowing God, yet almost nothing about the book lines up with a comfortable, decent, reasonably educated middle-class lifestyle he's so heavily invested in identifying with. For example, the Bible openly condones and allows for slavery and never once retracts this stance. However, Mike knows slavery is wrong, and everything about it offends his sense of basic human decency. So he's not about to own slaves, tolerate his neighbor owning slaves, or look back favorably on our nation's history of owning slaves. And to reconcile this baseline of basic decency with a Bible that falls far short of it, he ignores verses about slavery, or when necessary says it was only indentured servitude or that God just had to regulate it, and of course it was in the Old Testament and both doesn't count today and isn't in line with Jesus' overall message of love. Now does any of this reflect what's in the Bible? Obviously not. But Mike squints his eyes and just pretends the Bible is fundamentally in line with his values on the issue. Of course he does roughly the same with the Bible's endorsement of genocide, or with the many incomprehensibly and unjustifiably weird laws God saw fit to author. They were just part of his old covenant, ignoring the fact that they still represented his desires and character, or were an unfortunate necessity of the time, ignoring the fact that they shouldn't have been if God were all-powerful and had an ounce of basic imagination, much less infinite wisdom. In fact, Mike ignores the fact that a lot of things, because remember, this is an exercise in squinting and pretending things aren't there. But then we get to the difficult New Testament stuff, like where Jesus told the rich young ruler that to inherit eternal life, he had to sell all he had and give it to the poor, or that it's easier for a camel to go through the eye of a needle than for a rich man to enter the kingdom of heaven, 
or the many other indications that one should give of one's wealth or share communally with those who have need. But Jesus' advice was only for that specific young ruler himself, because wealth was a stumbling block to his personal spiritual journey, you see, even though the Bible never says so. It wasn't a command for everybody. And the camel through the eye of a needle is just a figure of speech meaning something's difficult yet still possible. And, see, God wants good things for Mike and his family. So Mike feels justified not only dismissing these as absolute mandates, but flatly ignoring any intended prompt to think about his wealth and how he should handle it, and to instead just continue treating the poor as he would if the Bible never existed. Because remember, everything is about protecting the decent, comfortable, middle-class bubble he lives in. And if he needs to ignore the horrors of the Bible to keep the bubble decent, he also needs to ignore its teachings about wealth to keep it comfortable. So it would seem that the Bible doesn't inform any of Mike's opinions on anything at all, because he has a habit of interpreting scripture in ways that always, somehow often with no textual justification whatsoever, seem to conform to and justify his decent sensibilities and middle-class lifestyle. Weird, huh? But the Bible isn't entirely a non-factor. See, Mike isn't a raging sexist, so as somebody who isn't a raging sexist, he decides that everything about how the Old Testament treats women is just a relic of the necessities of that day, and, well, f*** the details, it just doesn't count because it's the Old Testament. And much of what Paul says about women is not about women in general, but the uneducated, unruly women of a specific culture, so that doesn't count either. But, he doesn't think men and women are exactly the same, so, while he's not as harsh as some other fundamentalists, you know, the crazy ones, he feels the Bible gets at some core truth about gender roles, a truth that, like everything else, conveniently lines up with Mike's personal feelings on the topic. See, if you'll remember, I did say Mike has his biases. So sometimes, in using the Bible to point back to his personal middle-class lifestyle and opinions, he's also trying to accommodate certain opinions that are just a little... conservative? So he settles into whatever comfortable stance best reconciles whatever slightly old-fashioned ideas about gender roles, i.e. mild sexism, he still holds on to, with his modern sense that women are equal, and he takes whatever from the Bible reinforces the former, while ignoring enough from the Bible to allow for the latter. And generally, this doesn't impact his thinking if he just uses it to justify whatever stance he currently holds. But here's the problem. His personal journey away from mild sexism involves noticing his own pre-existing biases, reflecting on what they are, why they're irrational and how they impact other people, and then deciding to be different for reasons based on empathy and a rational understanding of the consequences of his actions. Bringing the Bible into it, including giving credence to or even retroactively rationalizing its overtly commanded sexism, plants the idea in his head that whatever he thinks about women comes from blindly follow divine dictate. This keeps him from introspecting on how his opinions are formed and being deliberate about how he shapes them moving forward thus leaving him vulnerable to thoughtlessly staying attached to current irrational biases or drifting toward other ones that may appeal to him in the future. And as you might expect, he treats homosexuality in roughly the same way. He thinks it's wrong probably for reasons rooted in personal distaste and pre-existing cultural biases. Now the Bible may be at the root of, or at least culturally entwined with these biases, but Mike really doesn't reflect on how, why, or to what extent. He just makes sure the Bible steers back to whatever he thinks. That he has the right to believe homosexuality is wrong, and he should love the sinner and hate the sin, but... You know, killing them was... Whatever, Old Testament and stuff. And the part in Romans about them being the final product of a slide down the slope of depravity? Well, we all sin, and are thus somewhere on our way down that slide. So squint your eyes, and we somehow end up with a decent, comfortable, middle-class lifestyle with opinions that might be douchebaggy but only to a socially acceptable extent. Abortion? Well, that's got to be in there somewhere, because the Psalms say God knows us in the womb, even though the Bible never explicitly condemns abortions and actually commands them as a way of testing women for infidelity. So yeah, his off-the-wall interpretation of the Bible clashes with forward-thinking sensibilities, but only in the ways that his current regressive thinking clashes with forward-thinking sensibilities. Weird how that works. The whole thought process is neatly illustrated by Mike's approach to Genesis 1. He doesn't think the earth is a flat disk covered by a dome surrounded by primordial waters, because that's plainly absurd and thus metaphorical. However, the earth was created in six literal days without using evolution, because he has to draw a line somewhere, 
And that line is drawn where his personal, culturally derived version of Christianity currently thinks the Bible started being literal. A line may be drawn for reasons that aren't entirely textual. Thus, Mike uses the Bible to land where he wants to land anyway. The book doesn't affect him much, except, I guess, insofar as it, one, reminds him of obvious principles he should remember anyway and could reinforce equally well using other forms of literature, and two, confuses him by making him not introspect on why he believes what he does, thus allowing for his thoughtless insistence on a few backward opinions that currently fit with his intersection of old biases and modern basic decency. He thinks that someday, with God's guidance, the world will steer itself back to values that never existed except as an ideal produced by the collective imagination of his current generation of believers. But it doesn't work that way, and society will drift where it drifts, and religion will adapt to whatever extent it wants to adapt. Someday, as culture changes, the religion of Mike's children and grandchildren and their reading of scripture will change, until maybe future generations will look back at Mike and think he's as repulsive and weird as he would think all past generations of Christians were if he could actually go back and meet them. Meanwhile, Mike will continue to believe that his personal version of flash-in-the-pan 21st century American evangelicalism represents what always was and always will be true Christianity. Because, of course, it is based entirely on the Bible. This program was made possible by a grant from S.R. Foxley, Bob Generic, Brandon Lemire, Bullwinkle, and Q, and by the generous support of viewers like you. If you'd like to join them in pledging to this channel, please find a link to the Prophet of Zod Patreon below.